Hello, my name is Angela Shoup, and I'm an audiologist and director of the Division of Communicative and Vestibular Disorders at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. In this role, I work with the newborn hearing screening program at Parkland Hospital and the Pediatric Audiologic Diagnostic Services at Children's Medical Center. Today, I am happy to have the opportunity to talk with you about some considerations in the newborn hearing screening process. The purpose of newborn hearing screening is to ensure that infants receive appropriate amplification and intervention services by no later than six months of age. For this reason, state and national guidelines recommend a 136 model. In this model, the screening process should be completed by no later than the first month. The diagnostic evaluation process should have yielded a confirmation of hearing status no later than three months and appropriate amplification and intervention services should be initiated no later than six months of age. Providers must recognize, however, that these guidelines are the outside edge of acceptable timing as earlier accomplishment of each stage of the process would be advantageous. Progression through the necessary stages may be impacted by a number of factors. Some examples of factors that may influence progression include parental acceptance of the diagnosis, and willingness to pursue early intervention, other health concerns, funding, and availability of services. For this session, we are going to focus on common questions asked about the first stage of the UNHS process, the screening. Texas House Bill 714 became effective September 1st of 1999, requiring birth hospitals to implement universal newborn hearing screening by the year 2000 to 2001. In addition, hospitals are required to report results to the state, parents, and providers. An update to Texas UNHS legislation occurred with Texas House Bill 411, effective January 1st of 2012. Modifications to the original bill included re redefining birthing hospitals to include hospitals offering obstetrical services, licensed birthing centers, and children's hospitals. Thus, children's hospitals are now responsible for screening babies transferred to their facility from the birthing hospital prior to completion of a hearing screen. All hearing pro screening programs must be certified by the state. Outpatient appointments should be completed within 30 days post-discharge. Further, diagnostic audiological results should be reported to the state, and this requirement is now tied to licensure for audiologists in Texas. Two screening technologies commonly used are otoacoustic emissions, also referred to as OAEs, and automated auditory brainstem response, or AABR. OAE testing is accomplished by placing a soft probe in the infant's ear canal. A sound is presented from the probe, sent to the eardrum, and through the bones of the middle ear to stimulate the outer hair cells of the cochlea. If the outer and middle ear are clear of blockage and the outer hair cells are functioning properly, the outer hair cells will send a response through the middle and outer ear to the probe. A little microphone in the probe will collect the acoustic response from the ear and send the information to a computer where the response will be analyzed. If a sufficient response is collected from the outer hair cells, the baby will pass the hearing screening. If a sufficient response is not obtained, the baby will have referred. For AABR testing, small disc sensors or electrodes are placed on the baby, typically on the nape of the neck, forehead, and shoulder. These sensors do not provide any stimulation. They only pick up electrical activity from the brain in response to sound. Sounds are presented through earphones and the brain waves associated with processing of the sound are picked up by the sensors and sent to a computer for analysis. If suffi sufficient responses are obtained from the brain to the sound, the baby will pass the hearing screening. If sufficient responses are not obtained, the baby will have referred. Most permanent reduced hearing sensitivity is associated with damage to the sensory hair cells in the cochlea, although there are cases of reduced hearing due to nervous system dysfunction, and this is referred to as auditory neuropathy. 
Screening with otoacoustic emissions will identify infants that may be hard of hearing or deaf due to issues with the sensory cells in the inner ear. Screening with AABR will identify not only infants that may have sensory cell issues, but also infants with nervous system pathology or delayed neural maturation. As auditory neuropathy is believed to be more prevalent in the infants with other health concerns, national recommendations allow for either technology, OAE or AABR, to be used in the well baby nursery with AABR being the technology of choice for screening babies in the NICU. And this is according to the Joint Commission on Infant Hearing 2007 statement. The 1-2-3 screening process. The overall health and well-being of an infant is the most important consideration. Infants in the NICU should receive a screening at the appropriate time in the course of their medical care. This will likely be close to discharge and in many cases will mean that the initial screen will be at an age greater than one month. Delaying this screen will also ensure that the final screen reflects auditory status after any additional procedures and or medical treatments. Since the initial screen may occur in an older age in these infants, an outpatient screen may not be necessary and the infant may need to be sent directly for a diagnostic audiologic evaluation if they do not pass the inpatient screen. Since aural atresia is going to require more in-depth testing, infants with bilateral aural atresia should not receive a birth screening but should be scheduled for a full diagnostic audiologic evaluation and an appointment with an otolaryngologist. Infants with unilateral atresia may receive a birth screen to assess function of the non-atretic ear, but they should then be sent directly on for diagnostic evaluation and otolaryngology consultation rather than an outpatient rescreen. A screening procedure does not provide definitive information about status of the auditory system. There are a variety of possible outcomes from the screening test. For infants that pass the newborn hearing screening, the birth history should be reviewed to determine whether the infant is at risk for delayed onset of hearing loss. If the infant passes the screening, the assumption is made that they have normal hearing or no greater than a mild reduction in hearing sensitivity. Essentially, the infant is deemed to have sufficient hearing to support speech and language development. Since there can be cases of higher level processing issues or delayed onset hearing loss, families and primary care providers must continue to monitor speech and language development and have testing re repeated at a later date if needed. If the infant passed an OAE screening and does not progress with language development, a test of auditory nervous system integrity, such as the auditory brainstem response, may be recommended. A refer or did not pass result on the hearing screening does not mean that the infant is hard of hearing or deaf. A refer result means additional information is needed about the infant's hearing abilities and the infant needs to receive additional testing. Newborns may refer on the initial hearing screening for a variety of reasons some of which may resolve in the first weeks of life, and some of which may be permanent. For example, debris in the external ear canal, such as vernix, or fluid in the middle ear, may cause a refer result on the newborn hearing screening, especially if OAEs are used for the screening. If the infant initially referred on the test due to a transient conductive issue, such as vernix in the ear canal or fluid in the middle ear cavity, the condition may have resolved before the outpatient rescreen, and the infant may then pass. If the infant refers on the outpatient rescreen, the infant should be scheduled for a diagnostic audiologic evaluation. Parents and primary care providers should receive information about the screening results and technology used. Information should be provided about the specific test results and what the test results mean for the individual child. For infants that pass the hearing screening without risk factors, information should also include developmental milestones for speech and hearing. If the infant has risk factors that are associated with delayed onset of hearing loss, parents and primary care providers should be notified of this and provided with recommendations for follow-up testing. 
If the infant referred on the hearing screening, recommendations for outpatient rescreening or comprehensive diagnostic evaluation should be provided. As with any clinical appointment, when an infant and family present for outpatient rescreening of hearing due to a refer result on the inpatient screen, the outpatient service provider must obtain birth history information. It is of utmost importance that the provider completing the outpatient rescreen confirm the type of screening completed in the hospital. If the patient referred on an OAE screening in the hospital, either an OAE or AABR outpatient rescreen may be completed as OAE and AABR both assess function of the pathways evaluated on the OAE screen, the outer ear, middle ear, and the inner ear. If the infant referred on an AABR, however, OAEs cannot be used for the rescreen as they assess the auditory pathway only from the outer ear through the inner ear and do not assess the nervous system pathways through the brainstem as are evaluated with AABR. If the infant received an OAE screen at birth but was in the NICU or met other risk factors as noted in the JCIH statement indicating that an AABR should have been used in the initial screen, an AABR rescreen should be completed. All stakeholders who may support the family through this process should be provided with information about the hearing screening. The parents should be fully informed of those with whom information should be shared and they should be provided with an explanation of the purpose of providing the information so that they are comfortable with the process. For all infants, regardless of test results, the parents and primary care providers should receive hearing screening information in order to appropriately manage the infant. In addition, according to Texas State legislation, the Texas EDI program, Texas Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Program, with the Department of State Health Services, should receive information through the TEDI MIS system supported by their contractor, Oz Systems. For infants that do not pass the hearing screening, information should be sent as well to the referral source that will provide the diagnostic audiologic assessment. According to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the family should also be referred to Early Childhood Intervention, or ECI. In addition, the family may also benefit from being referred to a family support program, such as the HOPE Parent Partnership Program, or Texas Hands and Voices Guide by Your Side. Many families, however, will wait to access these referrals until after confirmation of the hearing loss through the Diagnostic Audiologic Evaluation. For this reason, parents should be questioned about their interest in these types of services at every step in the process. Thank you for your interest in the newborn hearing screening program. Hopefully, as members of the Texas EDI System of Care Community of Support, we can continue these discussions in the interest of improving outcomes for infants and their families.